Thank you, Sandra. I don't know if Leah is already online. Yes, she is. Hello, Leah. How are you? Hi, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us here in the room, those of you following in Pergamino and those of you following on Zoom. Of course, needless to say that we have been, ever since the beginning of 2020, we have lived an unprecedented experience as a generation. We are in a pandemic and, of course, all human activities were affected one way or another are community, in particular LACNOC, since our mission and vision, as you just heard, we were particularly affected by this pandemic. Our 2020 LACNOC was hosted on Zoom only, but welcoming or to quote someone from IETF who said that we've managed to keep this community at work by using our social capital. So those relationships that we have built over the course of the years and we need to continue generating this social capital and these relationships and I think that us being here today is one step further to going back to that sort of new normal. These hybrid events are very challenging. We really knew how to host virtual events or in-person events, but this mixture of both is challenging to us. At LACNOG, well, these two days would be sort of an experiment, if you may. The first experiment is the panel that we are hosting right now. We have Leah as the virtual panelists and two people here in Montevideo. And the title for our panel, it's Elements No Network Should Do Without. It was Nicolás's idea. It's plagiarism, really. Uh, really, I'm borrowing that idea from Nicolás. And it's really that, just an excuse to discuss what problems we are facing as network operators and what we've done to solve these problems in the hopes that all of you find these ideas inspiring or useful. I will not introduce uh, Lia Gonzalo or Nicolás again. So I would like to ask Lia to start. I know she has some time constraints. She needs to travel. She has a plane to catch. So Lia, how are you? Where are you? I'm in Virginia. I'm in the north. I'm following the event from the north. Great, Lia. So, Leah, today I wanted to discuss international non-operator bandwidth and, and traffic, and she will speak about some of the particular challenges that she has in Bolivia as a country. So, Leah, what can you tell us? Thank you. Greetings, everyone. Yes, this is something that is quite difficult for us during the pandemic, and, and really some a lot of theory that we always discuss really were useful at the time. For example, having policies in place, working policies, bandwidth, and having reserves as to what we could use, how much we could use, and what would the threshold of traffic would be and that's when we were faced with a new challenge the fact that many of the decision makers are speaking about idle capacity so a good policy suggested policy would be to have 70 percent occupied and a 70 percent available to make decisions so behaviors of our clients is a variable that we cannot necessarily control. So we have to provide services and maybe then they decide to use 100%, which is what happened during the pandemic. Speaking about bandwidth, we could also have iterations. Sometimes there are many tools for simulating, simulation, simulating traffic, or we can simulate drops. What happens if this link drops or fails? And we also need to consider how about if we only uh, hire one supplier or more than one supplier. If one link fails, for example, we might have a backup. So these are some, several aspects that we need to consider. This is also connected to the local traffic that we have. Everyone plays a big role. A, an exchange point in the country will play an interesting, uh, an important role because we want to make sure that we have at least local connection available. 
and having redundant lengths. When we hire a service, it's it's even about a business issue, having redundant uh, lengths or not. So the policies need to be clear. We need to have documented policies, which sometimes we fail to do. So all of these aspects have been really very helpful in my country. We are a Mediterranean country. We don't have um, a close to the to the sea so really having these policies in place have been very useful these policies were questioned at some point because people consider this was idle higher traffic but as i said before it, it turned out to be very helpful really thank you leanne we will come back to you in a minute we are now coming to montevideo and gonzalo you will have the floor gonzalo as you said earlier, well, he is the operations manager for the mobile network of Antel in Uruguay. And I am happy to say that he's one of the few people that has implemented IPv6 in a mobile network. I'm so happy to see that. And actually, he's been working on that for a long time. And what, one year? No, no, over, over one year. So if you have Antel mobile devices, you're using IPv6 on them. Gonzalo will speak about some of the challenges that they have to, to face in terms of um, terminal and user traceability in their network. Thank you, Carlos. I am so happy to be here today, joining all of you and be able to speak about traceability. First, let me say that, of course, IPv6 implementation was a great achievement, an achievement that takes a lot of work and a lot of time due to different issues. So we have a mobile network, well stack, dual stack, that it's what we finally ended up implementing. So regarding your question, traceability in telecommunications network, is it's quite important. Why? I mean, we had long time ago a certain image with a public phone, someone called and you just needed to wait a few minutes to be able to trace that call and then try to find that person. But like in the movies, right? Yes, exactly. Like in the movies, you needed to keep someone on the line in order to be able to trace them, but they would hang up before that was possible. Well, that's the past. We now have mechanisms in telecommunications networks that allow us to identify people and of course we need certain safeguards in uruguay and in other countries telecommunicate circuit telecommunication networks or phone networks this has been solved a long time ago really and we have certain mechanisms that really ensure confidentiality and safeguards you cannot just trace or identify everybody but that is changing because circuit telecommunications are now in the past and we have voice over ip on social media or other type of media and that's the whole ip world that come, comes into place now we are speaking about ipv6 if we can associate or if we can identify which ip is generating the traffic with the agreement of the operator we would be able to identify now the problem is when we have ipv4 there are certain restrictions with regards to quantity and we are applying different uh, mechanisms so the public ip or the destination identifies that communication and is hidden under the NAT uh, translation. So to the network, it's more difficult to identify that client. So it is important to take into account that you have to have a strategy, if required, identify the clients not to identify the person, but to identify the traffic in the case of malicious traffic. So you have to have a strategy. This is not easy. But among those strategies, you have the issue of registering communications. For example, let me give you an example. In the mechanism where you do nutting, you have logging all those communications is quite difficult. So this could be a mechanism 
whereby you use a port pre-assignment. X number of individuals have this range of ports to connect to the internet world. So if at a given moment it is necessary to know who is behind that NAT, this would be easier. It would be simpler to see who from that smaller set is establishing the communications, of course, with all the required guarantees. So there are strategies. You have to think about this. So this has to be considered in a legal context, of course. It could be necessary, but we should bear in mind that traceability is a requirement for the telecommunications networks. So I would like to ask you a question regarding that. So you say that you do port assignments and these are somehow associated to blocks of users. Is that so? How do you classify these? Well, normally you have to have simple strategies. Whatever is complicated cannot be scaled up, especially in a world where the devices increase like seeds in the fields that are well watered. Yes, we normally have simple strategies of IP blocks and uh, port blocks. Let me explain one of the strategies. You always have to know who has a given IP from the times of radius. We always know the person who has a given IP. So with an impact on that table, you select, can select a limited number, for example, 18, 16, 32 clients who if you know from what port range or IP they are, then you can identify that small group of people. If they have a register at a given moment and a couple of minutes later they change the IP and this is originated in another port range, this can somehow be correlated if required in the sense that that element is originating traffic in a known way. You have to use statistical algorithms tool. So you have to follow strategies that is necessary. And if we had IPv6, maybe not. Yes, exactly. I understand that you ultimately end up limiting the where you have to search for this, but then you have to do an individualized analysis. You have no way, even so, this continues generating a problem with that with what you can do with IPv6. Well, there are two basic problems, namely the need for registering and logging all these connections. So for each connection, so we have a, a, a way to do this, a temporizer. So if you know the port of origin for that traffic, you can identify the subscriber, but that is not common. You say, I'm being attacked from that IP not from that IP and from that port, because those records are not kept where you receive traffic. So if you know the origin IP, you have a possible set of subscribers or elements or individuals who are originating that traffic. If a couple of minutes later, you a strategy is taken to randomize those IPs, those ports, and at another moment you have that same record of an IP, from an IP attack from another plate, you have eight clients at one moment, and at another moment you might have a coincidence. So, so the intersection of the two sets limits it. Okay, that's one of the ways. So you have to have a strategy. And I wanted to take you to the concept of port of origin because at the LACNOG events, this is something that from the LACNIC uh, papers that were submitted, this has to do with ports of origin. So in the past, ports of origin was of information that nobody logged in the past. And this is not part of the default configuration of any application on services. So we say, okay, go and configure your uh, patches and all the rest to log the port of origin because in today's internet with IPv4 exhausted, the port of origin is essential to do mitigation of abuse. Thank you, Gonzalo. Hi, Nico. How are you, Nico? Hi, greetings. Hello, Carlos, Gonzalo and Leah. We're going to switch topics now. We're going to go a couple of layers upwards in network models and let's go over to DNS. Nico, DNS and other issues. Well, first of all, thank you, Carlos, and thank you, LACNOC and LACNIC for participating in this panel. 
and hi good morning good afternoon to everyone and i was thinking about gonzalo's uh, comments and your comments when you made this gesture to pick up the phone and in 10 years time if you do that gesture nobody will understand what you're doing and if we do like this to dial <laughs> Well, one of the things that should not be absent in any network operators area is a, a chair like this. So, in my five minutes of fame, I would like to speak about DNS and some extensions or additions or protocols that extend the original DNS protocol with some functionalities. So, to review rapidly, when we speak or now when I'm going to speak about DNS, I will divide this into three parts. The problem, on one hand, we have the client who does the query. I would like to know the IP address associated to a given domain name. Then we have the server, the resolver, the recursive resolver what how we call it normally who receives the client's query in order to not look the client not to look this up they look up this answer and send it to the client and then you have the authoritative service who really contain the information the association between the ip address and the domain name and they then dialogue with a recursive server in order to provide the service to the recursive server and then back to the client so in that infrastructure, let us recall that the DNS is not concentrated. This is the distributed architecture. It's like a big database that is distributed throughout the internet and physically throughout the world. So let us also recall that that database looks like a tree upside down. We have the root above and then all the domains downwards. So the higher you go in the hierarchy, the more important it is to access that service because that service becomes more critical. The authoritative one is more critical because it concentrates more, not information, but you know, the points of failure goes become smaller and smaller and you get right to the root. So we have to have mechanisms so that this is resilient and tolerance resistant. And the first mechanism I want to speak about is the Anycast technique. What is the Anycast technique? And the first thing that we hear when we do a course on, on networks, say, well, the devices have to have a unique IP address so that they can communicate through the, to the internet. But the Anycast technique somehow tears down that in its first principle and consists in assigning the same IP address to more than one more than one device. So when I locate all those devices in the internet, all with the same IP address, the person who tries to exchange information with that device don't know with what device it will be speaking. The network will do its work, that's the magic of routing, and they will end up communicating with the one that is closest in terms of the network, not physically, but in terms of network terms. So what do I achieve with that? Combining DNS with the Anycast technique, I can get DNS authoritative servers. And instead of having just one authoritative server with all the information in one single location, that IP address, I replicate that server and I replicate these throughout the world in several networks all over the world. They all have the same IP address and they all contain the same information. That is important. They all have to have the same information. So I have to have a mechanism and there are protocols for this purpose to transfer information between DNS authoritative servers who somehow are in tune with the database of those devices. So the recursive server, when it will communicate, this will do it with the authoritative server that is closest to it of all that any cast cloud. And in that way, we improve two things. We improve the response times because the authoritative server is closer to the recursive server. So the round trip times. <laughs> this is a round trip time is shorter. So this increases the speed with which I obtain information and also increase resiliency. 
and particularly for this panel, I increase resiliency because I no longer have just one point where I store all the information which might fail. Everything can fail in this world. And that, thanks to that, we can we have work. And I have several points that contain the same information. So if one fails, it's OK, because that one would stop operating. That server would no longer publish its IP address. And then I would communicate with the next one that is closest, and so on. So this way, I enhance resiliency. So any cast is then to enhance resiliency and improve response time. And the second point is DNS sec. DNS sec is a security extension. It adds security to the domain name system, to the DNS. Now, where does DNS sec work? It works between the recursive and the authoritative servers. How does DNS sec work? At authoritative level, those who maintain the authoritative servers should sign electronically all the resources, the records, all the information they have stored, each type of information that they have stored in the authoritative server that is then stored in the authoritative server, in addition to storing, of course, all the IP address and domain name, it also stores the signatures as well as all the things that are required to verify that server. And on the recursive server side, DNSSEC validation has to be enabled. And the good news is that almost all, practically all the new versions of all servers, mind unbound, PowerDNS, all the recursive servers already include DNSSEC enabled by default. So I do wish to have DNSSEC and I receive a new installation of that. I have to disable it. That's not recommended. The best thing is to leave it enabled on the recursive server uh, validation and then the signed resources on the other side. So the recursive server, when it receives the information, it will verify the signature. If that is verified, the answer is sent to the client and otherwise an error message sent to the client so that the client doesn't end up accessing a site that is a false site or information to someone who is taking the role of authoritative server. I'd like to speak about some other protocols. There's a protocol or a technique called queue name minimization. So he's thinking about how to translate queue name minimization. This is about minimizing the content of the queries done by the recursive resolver and the key name minimization also works between the recursive and authoritative server. Now normally the recursive servers send first to the root and if they have information they ask the root what is the IP address associated to www.example.com the classical domain for these situations. So the root does not know, but it does know who the authoritative is for the .com. And finally, they ask the example.com. So the recurse for always sends the full query to all of these. They send who is or what is the IP address of www.example.com. If I have QNA minimization at recursive level, the recursive will ask the root, tell me who the authoritative is of that .com. And then please tell me the authoritative of example.com. And finally, the full query www.example.com is only asked for the authoritative for example.com. So what does you minimize, name minimization do? It asks for privacy. So as an authoritative server, I'm the only one who knows the full question, the root doesn't need to need. So I only submit to each one what is required to answer so that I can find the answer. And somehow the query is smaller and smaller, but generally this all fits in, in the datagram. This normally does not represent an improvement.
contras que puede tener Green Minimization, casi ninguna. Bueno, o sea, en negative aspects, pretty much none. Some very specific cases, it is true that Green Minimization might be suboptimal. The sequence of queries could take additional milliseconds, but really there's nothing against it or nothing that it's too bad about it. DNS privacy is quite interesting to discuss. You mentioned DNSSEC and it adds integrity, but not privacy. Privacy is not a problem. DNSSEC is trying to solve. It's not even part of the scope of their extensions. And to work on DNS privacy, we are operating on two aspects, non-disclosing more than needed and transportation uh, ciphering. The queries have to be private, so we might uh, push that to discuss later if we have time. Yeah, that's basically what I wanted to say. Some of the techniques to remember on DNS server, whether authoritative or recursive, ISP or exchange, uh, traffic exchange points usually operate recursive servers to provide their clients with recursive servers. Some operators decide not to do it and then redirect their clients to other public servers. I in particular like the first option better, that you each operate your own recursive server. Why? Because one of the joys of internet is that we are doing distribution of tasks. We are not concentrating everything, not, not putting all eggs in one basket. Why? Because things fail, of course. If you are operating open, what nine cluster or etc. open, recursive servers, they have a great team, a large team of people doing it, and they're not doing it wrong. It's about if I can distribute my resolutions better, that will make internet more resilient, of course. Let me remind everyone that you can ask questions if you are here in Montevideo, you can ask for the mic or you can ask online. Let me go back to Leah for a moment. Leah, and maybe you can take a minute and tell us about the simulation tools that you mentioned. Can I name brands? Yeah, I think so. Well, they might, we might gain a sponsor for the next time, who knows? Okay, so if you authorize me. Actually, Leah, you're the manager, so it's up to you. Okay, so I hope they reach out to us and then we can get more sponsors. The first time is for free. The second time, well, let's talk some sponsorship. Why is a good tool? It's a Cisco tool. And that what enables us to do link cuts and simulate uh, rigid balance. Of course, we need to really know clearly which links have been uploaded in order to do the simulation. Backbone administrators, and they put together an Excel, so they run a simulation where they cut a link, and it's about how much capacity do I need to hire from different suppliers, and then you drop one link and you swap the others. So it's a more basic, let's say, procedure. They do an Excel spreadsheet in order to go ahead with that link simulation. And it is quite effective. It is quite effective for those people who deal with the business side. They need to understand and then be part of the operation. So it's not just about the system to say here we have idle traffic that is not being used. And it is really hard to understand. It's about precaution. It's about being cautious. So these are maybe the two tools that we can use and in any meetings that you might have, it is important that we, we convey that message. What happens if this? What happens if that? If we have servers that are helping together with the uh, traffic exchange point in that country, well, what happens if those two drop? Well, someone has to take on that load or what about the other way around? We have good international quality, well, someone needs to take on that load. It's similar to what Nicolas was saying. We should not put all our eggs in one single basket. Thank you, 
Lia, Gonzalo, we are getting close to the end of the of the panel. IPv6 is something that well, I like a lot. I don't understand a whole bunch about mobiles, but in one minute, can you tell us what were the main problems to solve? Well, you, you will, you will get familiar with mobile devices. The world goes in that direction. Now you have to study fifth generation. Don't bother with the other ones. Okay, so I won't bother with the other threes or sixth generation even. The main problems were, well, the problems that we have in telecommunications network whenever implementing changes is the inertia of operators. Operators as the entities that need to deal with many changes in the network in an environment where it's really not very welcoming because not everyone will implement IPv6 at the same time. So you have to enable translation tools for accessibility. In some cases, if you do have enough IPv4, you use your stack. But some of the more complex cases, I mean, technically it is a large solution suppliers who will implement these solutions, they already have all the mechanics in place. It's more about management, I think. And sometimes with particular suppliers, it was about prices as well, because they worked with licenses, which is not very reasonable to ask for licenses for connectivity, but there were some who did require so. But in summary, the main problem, I think, is management when it comes to registry services, assignment, processing, they do take time, training, training takes a long time, training our human resources, it's not as simple to to, to manage a range of, of many beds, we used to have 32 in a fourth generation, now that has changed and it, it takes time. I think that's the biggest barrier, but of course, it is worthwhile. Traffic is more simple. IPv6 or mobile networks is much more beneficial. LTE only provides IP communication. So you do need IPs, of course. The best option is to have a version 6 IP because it's the most transparent. It's interesting that you mentioned uh, management support systems, because remember that in May, the event that we had in May, we had a presentation, uh, we launched a study by LACNE where we interviewed different operators in the region, and like uh, another study where we said that the main problem with devices, in this study, the main problem was the, the use and the adequacy of management support systems. It is a very large world, there are, there's a lot of customized software, developed for each operator, the models, the operations, and there seems to be consensus as to that is the next big challenge or the next big frontier. Nico, you see that we have only a few minutes left. So what about DNS? Do we burn it all up or what do we do? Well, you spoke about many things, but you didn't say how we implement it. So let's speak about that very quickly. For the first one that we mentioned, if I use recursive or authoritative servers, I can use the Denikas technique. This is applicable in recursive or authoritative servers. Now, I can also go for the more roots or the más raíces program in Latnik and or talk to some of these root server providers in my traffic exchange point, in my ESP, DNSSEC, it's usually the default if I am just installing a new or trying to validate in a, rec a recursive server or if I have an authoritative, I have to sign my resources, immunization is also at recursive level or you need to enable it. And then the other options that will contribute with privacy, we're having encrypted channels between the client and the recursive server and the communication like DOT or DOH. I like DNS on DLS because it's more transparent. 
It is the operators, uh, operating system and the recursive for all the other operations. So we would want to welcome operators if this becomes more popular to deploy it as well, to give their clients a DOH or DOT uh, solutions in their server so clients don't need to look for that solution elsewhere. Uh, cipher traffic for DNS are coming. That is coming. If we do not provide that option ourselves, someone else will. So we should have more control, particularly in the in the support services that we provide. See that we have a few seconds left. Let me speak about what happened on Monday. Well, this is Halloween, right? October is Halloween. So on Monday, in our safe routing tutorial, and the traffic exchange point tutorial, we were working with some Ford validator RPKI that were deployed, and we almost had to to cancel the tutorial. And of course, that's what usually happens. We had checked everything in the morning. Everything was working fine. When we were showcasing the, when we were showing the configuration and how the Ford R PKI server was working, we showed the configuration. When we wanted to see the process, it dropped. It failed, the our PKI uh, server was not working, routers could not connect. And what I'm saying will apply to our PKI and the others. There was an external change in a particular type, in a, in a generation of or our OA, in a certificate in the RIPE region, the Ford validator did not handle it well. It's something new, it's something that's still testing. The Ford validator did not deal it well, so it dropped. It wasn't just our Ford validator that dropped, all of them dropped in traffic exchange points because they did not understand it well. So what is the, what is the lesson learned from DNS or for validators or pretty much anything? I can increase resilience with several copies of the same server, but if I want to go one step further, is don't install the same software in all of them. Use different types of software. For example, an PKI Ford validator and then another one, a routinator or any. On a DNS, I'm going to use bind in some of my farms, unbound, or I combine both. Because if there is a security problem in one, I have will I will have the backup in the second one. Okay, I will interrupt, but we have a Q and A question. So Andrea, if you can please read the question for the panel. Actually, we don't have a question. It is a comment by Henry Godoy, and he says, I agree that we should look for NAT data for identification and that this takes a long time, but it is unavoidable and we should do it right now. Yeah, great, I agree. Thank you to all my panelists, Lia, Nico, Gonzalo, thank you for coming.